number one, one person, one question, one act. The world can be changed with just one. Right now we're seeing the world kind of torn apart because of one person. But imagine if you and I were to go after and reach out to one person with the love of Jesus, the power that that could have. This series is entitled, Who's Your One? Who's that one that God's put in your life, in your office, in your neighborhood, in your sphere of influence that you can reach and possibly change the in world? In John chapter number one, we're going to meet five of the men that would later become disciples of Jesus Christ. They are going to join with that inner group of 12 disciples. Five of them are going to be reached in John chapter number one. And so I want to begin reading in verse number 35. And if you don't have a copy of God's word, that's okay. Our church would love to get a Bible in your hand. I know you can download an app. I know that you can uh, get it on a tablet. Uh, but if you would like a copy of God's word, stop by our connect tent on the way out. We not only want to give you a gift for being our guest, we'd love to give you a free Bible. So you can stop back there and we want to get that to you. But notice if you would, John 1 verse 35, it says this. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You should be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, and he said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, where you were, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and he said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. We're in a series entitled, Who is Your One? Many times we can go through a series like this and people may ask me, Micaiah, why is it so important that we go through a series like this? It's a series about evangelism. Our church loves evangelism. We love corporate evangelism. We'll have mass gatherings, mass outreaches where we will provide food, where we will provide bikes, Christmas trees, Easter eggs. We provide all types of care along with the gospel. Um, our church loves outreach. But beyond corporate outreach, there needs to be personal outreach where you and I are personally engaged in leading people to find and follow Jesus. It's the mission of Southridge Church. It's why eight years ago, my wife and I left our steady mm, job. I worked at a church, didn't pay much, but it was a job. Left our medical benefits, and we maxed out our American Express card to meet with a small little gathering in a theater in the Oak Ridge Mall. Because we believed in leading people to find and follow Jesus. We said it's worth leaving everything to go and do that. So my wife and I, we, we pursued that, and God has been abundantly faithful over the last eight years. God has seen many things accomplished. God has done so much with so little, because God will never give you more than he can handle. He will always give us more than we can handle, but God will never give you more than he can handle, and we've always committed to that. It's not that I've had great faith. It's that I've had small faith in a great God. And so we pursued God and we said, God, we want to reach people. That's why it's so important. But even beyond that, here's the statement why it's so important personal evangelism. Because every person who has ever lived since the dawn of time has died and lived somewhere. You say, what do you mean? I thought you said everyone has died. And that mean they cease to exist. It's fine. It's finished. It's over. It's done. No, no. Everyone who has ever died is still alive. Because the Bible tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present somewhere 
You can go to Luke chapter number 16 where it says, and in hell the rich man lifted up his eyes. It was just a moment. It was just a moment. And, 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 and Lazarus was in heaven. You see, we're all going to go to one of two places where they're going to spend eternity with God in heaven or we're going to spend eternity in separation from God in hell. And that's why it's so abundantly important that the church takes on this mission to tell people about Jesus Christ, that they may know the hope of salvation. That's why John, who is the cousin to Jesus, said to his own disciples, here comes Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Messiah. The Messiah throughout history was one that they had waited for. Every picture in the Old Testament pointed to a Messiah. Every ceremony they had was to point Israel to the coming Messiah. And for John to say to the two people with him, there's the Messiah, immediately they say, well, we're going to go with him. And so that's what they do. You see, the church has been great about describing the gospel to people. The gospel is the good news. That's what gospel means. It means good news. It's a term that we've seen all throughout the New Testament. And the church has gotten really good at describing the gospel to people. We've gotten very poor at declaring the gospel. You say, what do you mean? I could ask people around, like, describe the gospel to me, and you could tell me all the facts. You may even know more about this book than I might know from even going to seminary and even studying this and even being in full-time ministry. You can have all the answers in the Greek and the Hebrew, and you may really know it, and you may be able to describe it, but if you are not declaring it, we are missing out what God said to go into all the world and preach, cry aloud, herald, lift up the gospel, which is the good news. That's what the church is called to. It wasn't just the apostles. It's what, why we gather. We gather here. We encourage one another. We equip one another. And then we go out and tell people about Jesus. We pray with people. We ask how we can uh, help people. That's what the church does. Our greatest work is never inside these four walls, but outside these four walls. And the greatest thing that we can do is tell somebody about the hope of Jesus Christ and the life that he offers. And in this passage, that's exactly what they do. We see in this passage in verse 41, the Bible says that here's two men. We meet them. There's one, his name is Andrew, and then you got Philip. And I love Andrew. Andrew is, doesn't get enough credit in the New Testament. But I love what verse 41 says. And it says, and he, Andrew, first found his own brother Simon. And he said to him, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Isn't that amazing? He received something, and man, he wants to share it. You can go to verse number 43, and in verse 43, it says, The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. And he said to Philip, follow me. Verse 44, 44 then Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law also the prophets wrote. You see a lot of finding and following in this passage, don't you? And here's one of the things that I, I'm amazed about is that Andrew and Philip, they find Jesus and immediately the word tells us that they went and found somebody else. If you're taking notes and all good Christians take notes because their mansions will be bigger and their crowns will be shinier in heaven. <laughs> you can write this down. People who find Jesus go and find other people that need to find Jesus. People who find Jesus go and find other people who need to find Jesus. Or if you want to abbreviate it, you can put this down. Found people, find people. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's why we exist. We want to depopulate hell and populate heaven. We want to make San Jose the place that if you are visiting San Jose, people know that San Jose is a place where, guess what? You're going to hear about Jesus from a church called Southridge. They want everybody to know about Jesus. As a matter of fact, I would love to be at some welcome center one day where people walk into San Jose and there's me and Pastor Meese. We're just sitting there like, hey, you want to know about San Jose? Well, first, let's talk about Jesus. We're just sitting there. It's like, ah, yeah, yeah, San Jose's great, but Jesus is better. Amen. That's what we want for this church. That's what we want to be known for. Some churches are known for their great worship, and I'm like, hey, we already got that. Check that box. Some people, some churches are known for great children's ministry. We got that. Check that box. Some churches are known for their great facilities. Ah, skip that box. And uh, some <laughs> other churches are known for, but we want to be known for Jesus, and we want people to get Jesus, because we believe, and this is not an oversimplification, that Jesus is the answer to all of mankind's problems. And we want you to have that. 
And so here we find that Philip and Andrew, they go and they want to tell people about Jesus. Isn't it amazing? We are good at spotting people and telling them what they need. I've done it. You've done it. You're going through the grocery store. You're at a restaurant and there's the family and they brought their toddler with them. And you're on your anniversary date or just a date and they sat the toddler next to you. And you're just thinking, I paid good money to be at Applebee's. Just kidding. <laughs> Applebee's on a date. No, never mind. Um, and you're like, man, you sat this noisy toddler. And immediately, I'm old school. I got spanked as a child. So I'm like, I know what that toddler needs. It needs a spanking. That's what that toddler needs. Some of you are like, oh, you judge me. I know. I, this is just how my parents raised me. It's, it's, it's good, built character. All right. Or you look at somebody like, I know what that person needs. That person needs to fix their attitude. Or that person needs this. We are really good at telling people what they need to do. Oh, they just need to do this. They need to do that. We are so good at spotting what people need. But rarely do you hear somebody say in a good way, they just need Jesus. They need his love. We're really good about doing that. Oh, yeah, they need Jesus. We're good at doing that. And that does nobody no good. But when are we going to get to the point where we see somebody and be like, man, if they just had the love of Jesus, when somebody really just gets in your face and they're upset and they're mad and you're just like, oh man, something inside of them is just broken and hurting and I wish that I could just get them the love of Jesus. That's what they need. You see, that's what Andrew and Philip had. They were like, hey, we got to go tell somebody about Jesus. we got to go after them. And I love how verse 41, it says this. And I love how the priority. It says, and he first found his own brother. You see, too often, many of us, we make an excuse why we cannot be evangelistic and tell people about Jesus. Because you say, pastor, I don't know where to start. Can I tell you, it's not a where to start. It's a who to start. It's never aware. You say, I don't know enough about this Bible. I don't know enough about the Romans road. I don't know enough about the three spiritual laws. I don't know enough. Guess what? Neither do I. None of us will have all the answers. But what we need to do is start with a who. That's what's so important. He started with a who. It's kind of like Dr. Seuss. He started with a who. His who was his brother, Peter. He said, I got to tell Peter. And I love that. He started with his family. And many times we don't want to start with family. We are, uh, I hear it all the time as a pastor. People are like, hey, Pastor Mackay, you're going to, can you go talk to my dad? Can you talk to my brother? Can you talk to my coworker? Uh, can you, can you talk to my family member about Jesus? And I'm like, why don't you talk to him? You know him. And they're like, yeah, but I may lead him astray. They're going to hell. What's worse than that? You're not going to lead them anywhere else worse than that. You're not going to mess with, it's not heart surgery. It's not rocket scientists. You're not going to break them. All right. But yet we're so caught up in, I don't know what to say. You know what's amazing in this passage? All it says is come and see. It's like, hey, I found Jesus. I want you to know about Jesus. It's introducing them to Jesus. You see, Andrew didn't have a thesis. He just said, we found the Messiah. It was this statement. And I think that's profound. He made a statement. I found the Messiah. He didn't ask Peter a question. I used to do this, and you may cringe that I used to do this. Uh, I went to a church where we would, every Saturday morning, we'd get there early, we'd knock on doors, and we'd present people the gospel. What it entails is you would ask a question. Somebody would open the door, and then you would say this. If you were to die today, and there's two strangers at your door. They open the door. It's a Saturday. They got their coffee. They're barely awake. If you were to die today, and all of a sudden, man, if they were hungover, they sobered up real quick. They're like, die today? And I'm like, if you were to die today, do you know you go to heaven? And obviously, I'd get door slammed in my face. Nobody wants some punk, acting filled teenager at their door on a Saturday morning telling them, if you were to die today, where would you go? But that's what I used to do. It was the question. Everybody was like, ask a question. Is that what Andrew did? No. He made a statement. He just said, hey, guess what? Water is wet. Nobody's going to argue with that. He said, hey, I found the Messiah. And he said it with confidence. And all of a sudden, it piqued Peter's curiosity. Where Peter's like, oh, really? We've been waiting for the Messiah. All our Old Testament scriptures have been talking about the Messiah. I want to know more about the Messiah. He went to family. That's who he started with. You know, too often, we're afraid to go to family. Genesis chapter number six, there's a man by the name of Noah. Noah was told to build an ark. 
Noah was a preacher. And the Bible tells us that for a hundred years, Noah preached. And he told people, repent, because judgment's coming. God's going to flood the entire earth. And he need to come into this ark. Do you know after a hundred years of preaching, he only reached his three sons and their wives? Six people. With Noah and his wife, there was only eight people that believed. Can I tell you, many people would look at Noah as a failure. I look at him as an amazing success. He reached his family. Because our family sees our flaws. They see our faults. They see that, man, we jump from one thing to the next thing. Remember the Atkins diet? Man, remember the South Beach diet? Remember the paleo stuff? All these phases we go into? All the fads? And for a long time, people look at us and say, oh man, this Christian thing is just going to be a fad. It's going to come and it's going to go. It's going to start and it's going to stop. But what we need to get back to is, no, I want to get people Jesus. I want to tell people about Jesus. And we start with our family. You know, 85% of the people that come to church come because somebody invited them. Our church, we do social media marketing, Facebook marketing. We put billboards up. We'll do mailers. We'll do everything. But can I tell you, the, the most of the people that come, they come because somebody invited them. As a matter of fact, you may be sitting in this auditorium today because somebody invited you. Because somebody took a little invitation, like a card like this, and they went and just found somebody said, hey, I go to a great church. I want to leave you an invitation. And that's it. That's all they did. They just, they, just, they just grab a card and they just invite somebody to church. That's all that is. They're Starbucks barista. They're going to get their dry cleaning done. They're going to get their car washed, the oil changed. They're going to a job. They're going somewhere. And they just said, I want to invite you to a church. That's it. That's all they do. And so many people were afraid what they're going to say. And more often than not, 85% of the people will say, yes, they want to come to a place that is filled with loving people and that has churros. We got churros. Church is great with churros. The Holy Spirit and churros, that's a miracle. And yet we've got both. And I'm telling you, folks, beyond all that, when you have Jesus, the one who offers hope, not just in this life, but in the next life, we offer something so profound. But I see he didn't just go to family. Notice Philip went to Nathaniel, which Nathaniel was his friend. Hey, it's great that you go to your family, but you also need to go to your friend. You need to make sure your friend knows Jesus. Why is it that we're so good at wanting to tell everybody, but we forget to tell our family and our friends? Don't you want them in heaven? I'm amazed at how often we skip family and friends. I'm amazed at how we'll tell complete strangers, but we don't want to tell family and friends about Jesus. They're the ones that need it most. I pray every night for my family. I want to make sure I reach my family. It's great that the church is growing. It's great that you're here. We love that you're here. It's exciting that we baptized three this morning and we'll baptize more this afternoon. It's exciting that the church is growing. It's exciting that you're here. But the greatest excitement is when I got to baptize my son Austin and I got to baptize my daughter Megan and when I get to one day baptize my son Cain and one day when Jane gets saved I'll get to baptize just kidding she's not here I can talk smack she's not in the room guys she missed out I, I'm just kidding some of you don't even know my wife Jane she's wonderful she's amazing she's usually here she's busy serving but understand this there's a privilege in reaching our family and seeing our friends one to Christ and seeing those that were around come to faith in Christ I love this. There's a man by the name of Dawson Trotman. He was the founder of the Navigators. This is a great group that primarily focus on military and they reach people. And he said this quote, people who point people to Jesus do so not because of what they know, but who they know and how they want others to know him. That's amazing. It's not because of what we know. Folks, I'm semi-young. I don't know all there is to know about the Bible. I've got a long time to keep learning. But it's not based on what I know. It's based on who I know. And I want others to know Jesus. There's one character in history that has the most volumes written about him. His name's Abraham Lincoln. There's over 15,000 books written about Abraham Lincoln. You would think eventually people would be like, why are we still writing about Abraham Lincoln? But people are still writing about Abraham Lincoln because he was not only an amazing man, amazing lawyer, amazing president. There was all these things to write about. But there's only one other character who has more things written about than Abraham. His name is Jesus. You see, my friend, there's still so much to get to know about Jesus. And these disciples wanted others to know about Jesus. They wanted him to know. They wanted to make sure that, hey, what we know about Jesus, others know. 
My wife and I, we used to do bus ministry. You say, what is bus ministry? Well, uh, we'd work at a church that couldn't really afford to pay staff, but we'd buy these broken down old buses from the school system. And basically these broken down old buses, we would take them all over to the rougher sides of town and we'd pick up children and teenagers and we'd bring them to church because their parents either didn't go to church or, or, or just couldn't afford to get to church. So we'd drive all, all over. I've been all over parts of San Jose and Santa Clara, picking up people and bringing them to church. We did it in San Diego. We did it in the place called Lake Los Angeles. It says where that, you don't don't want to know, uh, Mojave, Lancaster, Palmdale, and we would go all over and we'd pick up people. And a lot of times you would go to maybe a, a rundown neighborhood and go to a home and five or six children would come out. They hadn't brushed their teeth, hadn't showered, and it's early in the morning. They come running out and we'd give them hot Cheetos donuts. We'd sing songs, do uh, Bible studies with them. It was great. It would smell, but it was great. And we would get them on these buses. And man, these buses, these are broken, broken down old buses that could hit and fit maybe 80 to 84 kids on. We'd just pack it out. We'd be singing down the road. The bus would kind of lean a little bit. You know, shocks and struts are just done. And then we'd take them to church. And I went to a church that we used to believe in good old-fashioned potlucks. And after church, you go to the potluck. You say, what would happen at the potluck? Well, you see, every person has a recipe that they know their family won't eat. But if they bring it to church, they may somehow get enough people to say, mmm, that was good. Christians lie, okay, just so you know. You brought that casserole, everybody's lying. We do not like it. The devil didn't even like it, okay? So just saying, don't make the casserole. But I went to these church potlucks, and that's why Salzburg doesn't do potlucks. We will do churros, we will do food trucks, but we don't do potlucks, all right? And uh, we get there, and man, these kids, poor neighborhoods, rougher backgrounds, they may not have eaten, and they see the potluck. And oh man, they get excited. They grab their plate, and they look at me, can I have some? And I'm like, have as much as you want. It's basically hometown buffet Christian style, okay? We're just gonna pray before we get, get it. And man, they go down the lane, and they start putting the food on, and they're so excited. They're getting the chicken, they're getting the coleslaw. They skip the uh, uh, casseroles, and I tell them, yeah, that's the devil's food. Don't just keep on going, keep on going. They get down to the chips, they get to the salad, and they skip the salad too, and they get to the dessert table, and then man, they pile it up, and then they sit down and eat. And man, it's wonderful to see little kids eat, and they're just enjoying their food. And then they finish about half the plate. And you say, hey, you're gonna finish it? And they say, oh no, I'm, can I take it home? Because my brother didn't get to go, and he would really like this. My parents didn't get to go, and they would, they would really like this. Oh, it breaks your heart, right? So you get another plate, and you say, hey, here's another plate, take some more. And they wanna take it home. Why is it that children know if I got something good, I want to share it with somebody. And why is it that we have Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the most wonderful, special thing, the pearl of great price, the valued treasure, the bright and morning star, the one who gives us life and peace and joy. And why is it that we can't share that with somebody, but yet little kids can go to a birthday party and they say, can I have an extra slice of cake? Because my sister didn't get to go and she wants some cake and my brother didn't get to go and my family. Why is it that children can be better at giving things than sometimes we as adults, when we got Jesus and the church has to turn a corner and we have to say we need to make sure everybody knows about Jesus that every neighbor that I've got every family member I've got and I'm going to gather the family around and I don't care if I have to buy them all dinner I don't have to care if I have to pay for a nice meal to so get together and invite the pastor over and we will teach and preach we will do whatever it takes or you say hey we're going to talk about Jesus and let's bring Jesus into it I know we could talk about politics we could talk about sports we could talk about all these different things but the need of our family and our friends is Jesus, my friend. And the church has to get back to being like little kids and telling people about Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's where the church has failed. You know, 2 Kings chapter 7. Israel as a nation is surrounded by a warring nation. It's a horrible famine. This is a little bit graphic, but it was so bad People were doing everything they could to sell or buy a mule's head for food. It's that bad. It got even worse. They were selling the dung. The people were starving. There were some lepers who were starving to death. They were dying. They said, if we stay here in the city, we're dead. If we go outside, you know, there's that army that's sieged us. We're going to die there. How do you want to die? A slow death or a quick death? 
they opted for the quick death. So these lepers, they leave the city and they go to where this camp was supposed to be besieging the city of Jerusalem. And they go out and the army's gone. But all the tents are still there. All the cattle still there. All the gold is still there. Their robes, everything they brought for the siege, they just left it. So these, these lepers are going from tent to tent, just grabbing stuff, man. They're getting food. They're getting clothing. They're getting jeweled. They're getting horses. They're getting cattle. And man, they're like, we got to hide this stuff. So they take in their hiding and they're digging a hole and they're hiding the stuff. And then they, they look at each other and they said, there's people in the city they don't know that the army's gone. They don't know there's all this food. They're literally buying dung and eating a mule's head right now. And here's what these lepers said. They said, we do not well by not telling the city. Southridge does not well if we don't go to San Jose. We do not well if we don't go to Campbell. We do not well if we don't go to Morgan Hill. We do not well if we don't go to Gilroy. We do not well if we don't go to Los Gatos and we don't go to Los Altos and we don't go to Santa Clara and Palo Alto and Menlo Park and beyond in San Francisco and the rest of California and the Bay Area. We do not well if we keep this message to ourselves. This should not be the best kept secret in San Jose. This needs to be spoken out on the housetops, on the rooftops. We need to declare it and Stop just describing it. That's wonderful you can describe the gospel. My friend, when's the last time you've declared the gospel to somebody who needs it? We're just beggars telling another beggar where the bread is. That's what the church has to get back to. That's why we say, who is your one? But my friend, you and I, we are sitting back saying, who is my one? I'm going to take you to another passage of scripture. Because I think this is so important if we talk about who is our one. Luke 22, Jesus is talking to Peter. You see, Andrew reached Peter. Peter is outspoken. Peter is going to be the, the, the rock that the church is going to go forward on. And Peter is the man who walked on water. And Peter had a big mouth. And Peter would always speak before uh, really thinking. And he was one that was fire, aim, ready. He was always a little bit too sure of himself. And here Jesus comes to Peter and he says something so powerful. And I want the church of God to perk up and listen for a moment. Luke 22 verse 31 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, which Peter's name was before Simon, which means shifty, shaky, not firm. Peter means Petros, a rock. But here he calls him his old name, Simon, Simon. Indeed, Satan has asked for you. Talk about a sobering conversation. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. Sifting wheat means that's just how they would separate the wheat and the chaff and just, just, just sift it up, just to have its way and just break it all up. And Jesus is telling Peter, hey, Peter, that's what Satan has asked. By name, Satan has gone. And we know this to be true, that Satan gets before God and he is a blasphemer and he's one that accuses the brethren. And that's what Satan does. And so Jesus is giving Peter the inside scoop that, hey, just so you know, here's what's, what's going on in the underworld. And it's Satan wants you, Peter. And look what Jesus says in verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Hold on, hold on. He said your faith wouldn't fail, but then when you, when you return to me, strengthen your brother. So wait a minute. How, how, your faith isn't going to fail, but understand. There's a difference between when we fall and when our faith fails. See, Peter denied Jesus three times. He fell. The Bible tells us that a righteous man falls seven times but gets back up again. You see, in our Christian walk, we will all at times fail. I have failed. You and I may fall. But understand, there's a difference between failing and falling. And here, Peter, he fell, but his faith did not fail. He comes back and he strengthens the brethren. Peter Really what he goes on to say is, but he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. Later in that passage, you see Peter, he's, he's watching as there's this mock trial for Jesus. And he comes to a fire because it's at night and it's cold and he's warming his hands. 
In this passage, it doesn't say that the Roman soldiers came up and said, okay, you, Peter, let's go. You're going to jail. You stood with Christ. Let's go to jail. It wasn't Roman soldiers that came from Peter. You say, who was it? Was it the Pharisees? Is that who came and said, hey, you're next. We got an extra cross for you. Come on, Peter, you're coming with us. Is that what led Peter to deny Christ? No, picture the scene. He's at a fire. Middle of the night. It's cold. And then a servant girl who's still up attending to everybody. She also walks over to the fire. She's warming her hands. She looks up. And she was staring at Peter a little bit too long. Peter started to get uncomfortable. And then she's like, huh, I think I know him. You ever done that? You see somebody, you're like, ah, I think I know that person, you know, and it uh, happens to me all the time. I'm like, I think I know that person, you know, and then it's always worse when they know your name and you're like, hey, you know, so I love being a Christian because I can be like, hey, brother, sister, you know, it's perfect. Like, I can just kind of slip that one in and we act like we know each other. I went to a restaurant the other day and the person had a mask on. They were like, Pastor Micaiah. And I was like, hey, how are you doing? I haven't seen you at church in a while. And she's like, I don't go to church. I was like, well, that's why. Okay, there we go. Oh, man. Man. But you know, you just, you, you see somebody and you're like, I think I recognize them. And this little maid wasn't a soldier, wasn't a Pharisee. I'm not putting down women. Don't, don't take it that way. But this sweet little lady just said, aren't you one of the disciples? That did it. He's triggered. He's upset. He starts cussing. He's like, I'm not with him blankety blank that's Christian cussing censored blankety blank and all of a sudden in a moment he denies Christ he falls but his faith doesn't fail but how did it happen because he gave in to his feelings there's been people that have come to Southridge before and they said Southridge is filled with hypocrites and I tell them yeah you're right it is I go to the gym, but I love McDonald's. I'm a hypocrite, and I'm okay with that. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We will have moments when we fail as Christians because we're all in process. There are things I've done and things I've said and things I will do uh, that grieve my heart as well as grieve the heart of the Father. But we as a family say, yes, we may fall, but we're not going to fail. And too often there are Christians that they will say, oh, that's why I don't go to church. You know, everywhere you go is filled with hypocrites. The job you work at is filled with hypocrites. The gym you go to is filled with hypocrites. The bar you hang out at is filled with hypocrites. And yes, the church you attend is filled with hypocrites. But I'm so thankful this morning that the other 11 disciples, when Judas, or excuse me, the other 10 disciples saw Judas betray Jesus, and they saw Peter deny Jesus, that they didn't say, nah, see Jesus, you got a bunch of hypocrites following you, so I'm not following you. What did the other disciples do? They weren't following Peter. They weren't following Judas. They were following Jesus. And so they could keep following Jesus. Do not be the type of church that says, well, I was following Micaiah. No, no, don't follow me. Do not be the type of church that says, oh, we're just following this mega church and this person. Follow Jesus. It's always eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. That's who our eyes are on. That is not an excuse for me to live a reprobate and sinful lifestyle. I'm just saying it's never right for you to use that as an excuse why you don't go to church or why you won't associate. It's still the bride of Christ. It's still God's bride. But so often we use one thing to say, oh, that's it. And so many people don't understand that like Satan was after Peter. Notice what Peter writes in 1 Peter 5.8. He says, stay alert. Watch out. Because your great enemy, the devil, is looking for one whom he may devour. You see, if if we're supposed to have a one, can I tell you this? The devil has a one. You're the devil's one. And every Christian needs to perk up at that. Every Christian needs to sober up at the thought that Satan's after me. The birthmark of a believer is called the bullseye. Satan's after us. If he can get us to fall, he may be able to get somebody else. This is why we need to come around and encourage one another. You see, culture is pretty safe from Christian influence. Sadly, Christians are not safe from culture's influence. 
No one at your company, at your job is worried about the Christians. I don't care where you work. They're not like, oh man, these Christians are just really just turn around. Man, every time I go to the lunchroom, everybody's having a prayer meeting right there. Apple Tim Cook CEO is not like, oh man, these Christians, they're really influencing our whole company structure. I'm really worried about them. Nobody at Disney is like, man, these Christians, all of our new Pixar films are all Christian based. What's going on? They're not threatened by Christians. I could go into every church across this land and you know what they will all say? They're all threatened by the world and its culture. And they're worried about their children being influenced. They're worried about their teens, their young adults. Why is it backwards? Maybe that's why we no longer live in a Christian nation, but a post-Christian nation. I was listening to some people commentate on the early church when the disciples were coming up where there was no Christian and where America and Western culture stands, even Europe can be lumped in there, where we used to be Christian nations. They said we are post-Christians and so now we've reached the point where the apostles were starting. Think about that. The apostles worked, worked. You see the legacy of the church grow, grow, grow. And now it's in this decline to now we're back to where we started. Because the church doesn't understand that culture is doing a great job at evangelizing us. Far better than we are doing at evangelizing the culture. And this is not about a culture war. This is about the hope of salvation. I am not here to say we need to influence the politicians. What I'm here to say, that's Christ's job, but I am here to influence people with the gospel. That is our job. And too many Christians are punting and saying, well, we're just going to hold back on our faith because that's offensive. You know what also offends me when you talk about? Saving money. That offends me. Why do you want me to save more money? You know what offends me? Exercising. That offends me. Eating kale, that offends me. There's lots of things that offend me. Why do we like to pick religion as, oh no, we can never talk about that. that's offensive. Get over it, buttercup. Why are we all these snowflakes? Let's say, no, 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 it's not that I'm here to offend. It's that I want to give you something good. And if they don't receive it, that's okay. We go look for somebody else. Because guess what? In this passage, we see that Satan has a one. And it's everyone. I'm running out of time. Can we go back to verse 41 real quick? I love this because it says, he first found his own brother, Simon, and he said to him, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And when he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You should be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Worship team, can I invite you to the platform, please? Here's Peter, loud mouth, speaks before he thinks Peter. And here is Peter, the man that Andrew just said, I got to reach my brother. But then at Acts chapter number two, verse 41, it says this about Peter. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, 3,000 in all. Do you think Andrew, all those years ago, was thinking, I need to get Peter because Peter one day is going to be in Jerusalem. There's going to be a big crowd and Peter's going to stand up in front of these thousands and he's going to preach and 3,000 of them are going to give their life to Christ and we're going to build the church. Do you think Andrew was envisioning that? No. If anything, Andrew was just thinking, hey, Peter and I have this fishing business. He signs the checks. His checks are bigger than mine. He needs Jesus. So he starts paying me a fair cut, if anything. They're brothers. That's what a brother, I would do that to my brother. I just know it. If anything, he was never thinking that this man, Peter, is going to be the one to reach everyone. It could be that your one reaches everyone. But yet too often we don't say anything. We're silent. We don't want to tell the person. You can tell the lady who made the food and you're like, man, you did a great job serving. But you can't tell them, hey, man, you did a great job serving. I left a nice tip, but I would love it if you'd come to my church. You're so friendly and kind. You'd make a great greeter at our church. Why is that wrong? I work for Verizon. I would sell cell phones. Do you know what we would do? We would poach other cell phone carriers, people. 
They would pay me to drive into LA, parts of LA, and go to AT&T, go to T-Mobile, go to Sprint, and shop around. And if you see a good employee, steal them over to Verizon. I said, that's smart. Now, do not go to churches and be like, I like that pastor, bring him up. <laughs> You're messed up. But what is wrong about saying, hey, you go to church anywhere? No? Man, would you come sit with me? I'll get you some coffee. We'll have a good time. We'll grab lunch afterward. Anyone ever heard of the name Edward Kimball? Ever heard of him? He was a Sunday school teacher in 1850s. He had a burden for the young men that would attend his Sunday school. There was a young man by the name of Dwight. Dwight had moved out on his own to Chicago. And it was there as he was by himself, kind of making his own living, selling shoes at 16, that he said, you know what, i got to reach Dwight. And he would walk past the, the, the shop where Dwight would sell shoes. And man, he was pacing, just nervous. He was burdened for Dwight. He wanted to see if Dwight would be open to receiving Christ as his Savior. And he paced back and forth, and finally he went in the store. And Dwight saw him and said, hey, good to see you. Would you like a pair of shoes? And he said, yeah, 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 I'll take a pair of shoes. And as he's sitting down, trying on the shoes, he said, Dwight, I, I don't really need shoes. I want to tell you about Jesus. And Dwight listened. <laughs> Dwight knelt down right there and prayed something we call a sinner's prayer and received Christ in his heart. Dwight later went on to become an evangelist who would travel the world and tell people about Jesus. Dwight is better known as D.L. Moody. You can go to downtown Chicago and there's the Moody Bible Institute. It's a big college, the Moody Church. It's still there. This church is still going from 1800s till now. They offer a Bible college 100% free tuition for any student. D.L. Moody he preached all over the world. They said in his lifetime, he reached one million souls for Christ. He influenced a writer by the name of F.B. Meyer. If you've ever looked through a Christian library, you'll see, even my library, you'll see a lot of books by F.B. Meyer. F.B. Meyer was a, a prolific author and writer and speaker. And F.B. Meyer reached a man by the name of Wilbur Chapman. Wilbur Chapman came back to the United States and he was preaching and he reached an ex-baseball player who played for the Chicago White Sox. His name was Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday in the early 1900s led the prohibition in the United States. That was him. If you read in our history, the prohibition, no more alcohol, that was a man by the name of Billy Sunday. He was a preacher and evangelist. He started that. Well, Billy Sunday was in North Carolina. He was preaching. And in a meeting in North Carolina, there was a man by the name of Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham gave his life to Christ. Mordecai Ham, he also became an evangelist. And he was preaching in the mid-1950s. And one day, he set up an old tent. He put sawdust down. He invited the people to come around. And people from all the farms in that area of North Carolina, they would, after work, they would go to what was called a tent revival. There was a man by the name of William he kept coming every night and he was feeling the weight of conviction knowing that he would spend eternity without Christ in hell and never spend eternal joy in heaven with God. And he was under the weight of conviction. And one night he walked what they called the sawdust trail and he knelt down at an old altar and he gave his life to Christ. You might know William as Billy, Billy Graham, who took the gospel around the world who recently just passed. And Billy Graham, it's said, has reached innumerable millions for Christ. But where did it start? With the Sunday school teacher who cared about one. Could it be that your one may reach everyone? Could it be what starts right here at this little old church in this little old ballroom that there might be somebody today who gives their life to Christ and yes, maybe you'll never be known on a national stage. Maybe your name will never go down in history but you're going to reach that one person and that one person may be the person that the world sees a great revival that sees people come back to Christ in the thousands. I love watching the Billy Graham crusades because when he would give the altar calls the crowd barriers would get pushed aside as hundreds and thousands would rush towards 
towards the altar because they wanted to give their life to Christ. And the altar workers would be praying and there they would be singing an invitation song where it's come to Jesus. And they would invite the crowds by the thousands and he would look directly in the camera. And as he looked into the camera, he would invite people that were watching right then to give their life to Christ. And I met a lady in South San Jose and she said, I was watching TV one day and Billy Graham was preaching. I looked at the TV and tears started to run down my face and I got on my knees in front of the TV because it was like Billy was just talking to me. And in that moment, I gave my life to Christ. In that moment, my life was forever changed. But it started with Edward Kimball, a Sunday school teacher who said, God, I can reach my family. I can reach my friends. Church, who is your one? The world is waiting. This is a direct quote from D.L. Moody. He said, the world has yet to see what God can do through one man or woman wholly committed to God. With everything that's happened in our world, all the chaos, all the anxiety, all the anger, all the shootings, all the crime, all the horror in this world, there's an urgency. People are just on edge. But then you go into the churches, no urgency. Let me close with this statement. I want every person in this room to be, have found comfort in their soul, but never to be comfortable in these seats. If you want to be a part of the Southridge family, understand that I am challenging you and I to go find one person. I'm challenging us to be the church that says, hey, we exist for those who are not yet here. We exist to reach them. And maybe they'll never attend this church, but we exist to love and to care and to share with others, to pray with others, to lay hands with others, to say there is a church that loves you, that wants you, and that God has not given up on you. Because the world gives up on people, but the church should never give up on the world. Because God has committed himself to the lost causes, and the church has forgotten about the lost causes. We give up on the lost causes. We give up on the down and out, on the divorcee, on the drug addict, on the alcoholic, or the person who's hung up on life, the person who's got problems. And the church needs to be the first one to say, we've got you, and we love you, and we want you. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, if a man must go to hell, then may he do so with the Christian's arms wrapped around his legs holding him back from the flames. When's the last time you said, hey, if you're gonna reject Jesus, I'm gonna make it really hard because I'm gonna show you just how great Jesus is. Not that my life is perfect. My life is not and your life is not. We still get sick, we still have bills, we still have frustrations, we still mess up, but we understand that through it all, God is still good. It's not just what he's good now, it's how he showed himself good in our past. And we sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. And if he does nothing else in my life, that was enough. That was enough.